So, uh, bonjour, hello everyone. I'm very excited to uh, present uh, today's to webinar. My name is Fatima Awad. I am a member of Symbio Canada. Symbio Canada is a volunteer organization trying to create a space to gather synthetic biologists uh, all over Canada to give and share ideas, news, and collaborations. Today's uh, webinar is um, with Dr. Um, Claudia Vickers from uh, the CSIRO. So Dr. Vickers is the Director of Synthetic Biology uh, Future Science Platform in Australia's uh, Interna National Research Agency, CSIRO. And Dr. Vickers is also the founder of Synthetic Biology Australasia, which, uh, which regroups Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, New Guinea sorry, and the surrounding islands. Um, today's webinar will be about all of her efforts to build a synthetic biology community in Oceania and uh, as well as the, um, uh, the creation of new tools with synthetic biology to uh, model microbes to be able to produce plant synthetic or plant metabolites. We are very happy to have you here, Dr. Vickers, and I'll, I'll let you go. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, look, good morning, or as it is, I guess, good afternoon for the rest of you. I apologise, I've walked into work. It's hot and sweaty here. We're Southern Hemisphere, so it's um, it's summer. <laughs> it's pretty warm out, so it's already about 30 degrees out there. Um, and it's, uh, it's, well, it's a beautiful day. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure, and it's actually a real pleasure to talk about community building activities, um, which are a, a really... Um, I guess, I guess really close to my heart, having spent uh, so much time working in that space in the last, um, let's see, decade or so, a little bit more than a decade, maybe 15 years. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today a bit about community building activities and also a bit about science. And I'm happy to take questions in either area, obviously. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. And most importantly, can you see it in, hang on, let me just switch to display settings, the right format. Yeah. So you can't see the note pages. Great. Okay. Fantastic. All right. <clears throat> so that's me. Um, uh, as was mentioned, I'm the director of a program called a Future Science Platform in, in CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency. So I'm going to start with the building of a synthetic biology community side of things. Presumably, there we go. Um, and I'm going to first start by highlighting that Australia was a, kind of a little bit behind the rest of the world when we got going in this space. So um, synthetic biology is a discipline probably established about 20 years ago in the, in the, in the early stages of iGEM and, and various other activities that were going on in the US. And we, we map the progress of things, molecular biology and, that contributed into synthetic biology. It was really the early 2000s that things were um, underway. Uh, Australia didn't really get going until, you know, five years later or more when the first iGEM team uh, participated, but didn't really start engaging with synthetic biology as a discipline more broadly until, uh, the, uh, until about 2012, 2013, when there was this flurry of synthetic biology meetings run across um, University of Queensland, CSIRO, Macquarie University uh, and Defence Science Institute and Technology Institute. It's not very surprising that Defence got involved because Defence has been uh, closely involved with synthetic biology's development as a discipline, probably for dual, dual use purposes, and very much so uh, in the US. So it was a bit of a late start. We had quite a lot of catching up to do, but there was this, this flurry of activities, as I said, that happened in the sort of um, early 2010s, moving on and culminating in establishment of um, CSIRO's investment in, in the synthetic biology future future science platform. And I'll just walk you through what happened in, in the interim and, and how it got, got the discipline going in Australia. So the first thing was a strategy workshop that brought together a, a whole lot of people across Australia and New Zealand in 2013 with a set of pretty specific objectives, which was to develop this, the support of synthetic biology research community, look for where we belonged in the rest of the world, and identify some way to fund this, this, um, this discipline going forwards. Now, it wasn't, of course, like there was no synthetic biology going on in Australia and New Zealand. There was a lot going on, but it wasn't coordinated. There wasn't a direction. There wasn't the philosophy of synthetic biology that sat over that, which I'll get to shortly. 
So that was organised between myself and Colin Scott, uh, who is at, who's at CSIRO uh, at that time, and I was at University of Queensland at that time. Following on from that was the establishment of Synthetic Biology Australasia, which is the, this, this community group that really um, operates as a bit of a hub. Uh, so anybody who's interested in any aspect of synthetic biology, public, private companies, universities uh, can be involved in that. Having said that, it is mostly academic researchers that are involved in Synthetic Biology Australasia. Um, <clears throat> we held our first conference uh, in, in collaboration with CSIRO in April 2016. Uh, we had another con conference a year and a half later, um, hosted by Macquarie University. And then in October uh, 2019, I co-hosted again um, up in Brisbane, the, uh, the Synthetic Biology Conference, which is now a, an every two year sort of event. So there'll be a 2021 one, it'll probably be virtual. Um, and that means that we can invite people from all over the world, which is quite nice, but it also means it's in the middle of the night, your time. Um, there are now this year a number of chapters that have been um, established at key uh, key major capital cities across Australia. So we've got Sydney, Brisbane, um, Western Australia, or Perth and Adelaide. They've set up chapters locally, and there's there, there are more chapters coming in in uh, 2021 to be established. Um, it was really important to not be operating in a vacuum in this space and to get federal government support. And I'd worked fairly closely uh, with CSIRO, which is a statutory government organisation, to lobby for federal investment in the space and road mapping in the space. And one day I got a call out of the blue from someone in CSIRO who I never met who said, hey, Claudia, can you go down to Canberra and talk to the Prime Minister and convince him that synthetic biology is a good thing and they should invest in it? Now, I was a little surprised by this, obviously, um, but I said, yeah, sure. And, and there I found myself um, in the cabinet room of the Australian Federal Parliament explaining to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's Commonwealth Science Council why we should invest in this road mapping report in, in synthetic biology. And happily, he approved that uh, that process. And the um, it was run by an organisation called the Australian Council of Learned Academies, which includes uh, representation from all of our learned academies, engineering, science, humanities, etc. And um, had a, an expert working group of which I was on with one member of each of the academies. So it was released in September 2018, um, and it's called Synthetic Biology in Australia, a road, an outlook to 2013. Um, I do recommend you go and have a look at it if you're uh, looking to establish something similar in, in Canada. Uh, but I will spend a little bit of time going through the findings that came out of that. And I will highlight that these were findings, not recommendations, because uh, this is a, a political beast at best, and we weren't allowed to provide recommendations because that, that's what politicians uh, read it, extract from and provide to their ministers. Uh, we provide findings. So um, it was identified fairly obviously that synthetic biology is a great opportunity and that Australia is well placed to become a leader in some specific areas and those are identified as, as protein engineering, metabolic engineering and circuit design, but that there was a need for strategic national investment to capitalise on the opportunity. Um, it was identified that synthetic biology will be transformational as we all know, so lots of different areas that it can affect. And that in terms of a biomanufacturing, we've got a feedstock advantage in particular through our sugarcane industry. So we make 5 million tonnes per annum of sugarcane and 85% of that is exported. But there's a lot of other biomass, of course, lots, a, lot of, a lot of it's lignocellulose, which is a little less accessible. Uh, but there's lots of other stuff going on that we can use to feed into that um, manufacturing pipeline. Uh, the Australian IP environment has a lot of strengths, in particular secure and facile environment, which is very important to invest, investors, uh, particularly in the region. Uh, and that it, it's really necessary, and now moving more into the, um, the humanities side, social science and humanities side of things, it's very necessary to be proactively communicating to not um, not run into the problems that we've had in the past with these genetic engineering processes, to earn and maintain public trust and to realise the potential and develop pathways to impact for these technologies. Um, <clears throat> there was an emphasis on social science to help develop those pathways to impact. So acceptability, engagement, responsible research. Um, there was a recognition that the regulatory environment had to incorporate community concerns. So we already had a have a very strong and effective regulatory environment through our Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. That act is actually reviewed regularly. So every sort of five to seven years, it's, it, it's under, a review is undertaken, unlike any other piece of federal legisl legislature. Um, and the regulators have to communicate and engage the community in that process. So it's already well established to be able to work effectively uh, to develop pathways to impact. 
Um, it was recognised that both our STEM and humanities and social sciences workforces is, is, is needed to be bolstered in order to capitalise on this. And there's a need to integrate both engineering and science and, and um, STEM and HASS side of things, so multidisciplinary teams. And it was recognised, of course, that we need to have an integrated national infrastructure, which at the time we didn't have, so high throughput DNA and organism engineering facilities. Um, it was also recognised that we have a problem with translation with this particular type of science in Australia, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And finally, it was recognised that, especially in the biomanufacturing stage, we would really need a production facility to demonstrate that, it, that it's possible to go from feedstock through to high value, um, high value or even mid-value products uh, out of this technology. The next thing that happened was a call through our National Innovation and Science Agenda under the INCRIS program, which is a National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, addressing this issue of a lack of um, integrated infrastructure in Australia. So it was a call for submissions in 2017, which led to a National Synthetic Biology Infrastructure Scoping Study of which, uh, on which I was on the expert working group, which ran across 2018-19. And the focus of that was to develop a shovel-ready investment plan for synthetic biology infrastructure. Um, all the way from that design, build, test, learn cycle that we use in Symbio to the scale up and, and, and market delivery side of things. Uh, that was submitted in August 2019 and hooray, we got an announcement in this year's um, end of financial year federal budget, which happens in, in June, July in Australia. And we've got the first three years of that approved, which is actually not a huge investment, investment. it's 8.3 million, but it will help to join up and build that biofoundry infrastructure, um, which is already partially established. So I'll just take a few seconds here to explain to you um, uh, what CSIRO is. Uh, because it's fairly unique as an organisation um, internationally. There are some organisations that are similar, but it's, it sort of it's, it, it spans the breadth and depth of capability. So, um, and, and has been really uh, seminal, I guess, in establishing and developing synthetic biology in the nation. So it's Australia's National Science Agency. We just have the one, we're only little, very similar to Canada in many ways in terms of population, surface area and, and dispersity, et cetera. Um, so it hosts national research infrastructure. There are five and a half thousand people across Australia. There, we have 57 offices and sites across um, Australia and in the US, Singapore, Vietnam and Chile. And it delivers about four and a half billion dollars a year of value to the Australian economy through the science and technology that it's developed. It operates extremely broadly. So all the way from synthetic biology to space science and, and pretty much everything in between because it needs to deliver on the industry requirements of Australia. It was established a little over a hundred years ago now at a time when Australia realized that we were a long, long, long way from anywhere. And if we needed to develop science solutions to problems that would have bespoke to Australia, we we're gonna to have to be doing it locally. So it's extremely broad, very, very diverse. Um, there's nine core areas, but they're not, they're not sort of exclusive areas and they basically cover everything. Um, it's, it's extremely industry focused, so it really operates at the interface between basic scientific re, um, research and deliver, delivery to industry. So it's Australia's largest patent family. Um, they're, they're, it, we operate in, in spin out companies um, and partner very, very broadly, and there's about a billion of, of, to, of market capitalization and portfolio companies and 170 startup companies. It also operates in teaching and education space. So though while we don't run um, undergraduate programs or training programs like a university, we teach into um, secondary schools, we run support programs for universities, we take interns, we host PhD programs that are um, managed through a university. So we don't award PhDs, but we host them. Right, so the Future Science Platform Program, what is that? It's basically a program to focus on an, an, an area of science that sorry, it doesn't do very much in. So Horizon 3 science um, bordering on blue sky, sky science. And this is science where there is a long delivery frame to impact maybe five to 10 years. Blue sky is where you might not actually see a delivery frame to impact, but there may be one there. And the mission of that um, program is to reinvent and create new industries for Australia. And of course, for synthetic biology, that was twofold. So the first step was to create and foster the step change in national synthetic biology capability. And then ultimately down the track to build a synthetic biology based industry off the technologies that we were developing. <clears throat> so I just take a minute to remind you um, why we're here. And I actually think that this is extremely important to step out 
and look down and consider what sort of science we're doing, why we're doing the science and where we can have impact in the science. And I, I step very far out. So I step out so some out in, in, in the immediate space area around Earth and consider the planet Earth um, as a solar powered battery. And I got this from a PNAS paper that was uh, published um, some years ago now. So essentially Earth can be considered as a battery where sunlight comes in and charges the battery um, through deposition of uh, basically fossil resources. And we as human beings are now uh, discharging that battery and we're, we're discharging that energy that has been stored on the planet Earth and we're discharging it much more quickly than it can accumulate, which is obviously a significant problem and unsustainable. So we need to have this transition to sustainability. Um, we have a fossil-based economy now and we need to move towards a, a more circular and bio-based economy. Um, biology can give us this. Uh, it has, it's one of the, it's the only technological re revolution that can truly give us this kind of circular bio-based economy because it relies on the biological systems that we exploit um, on a daily basis. So there've been many technological revolutions in, in history. Um, engineering of biology really came of age in the late 70s and, and early 80s. And of course, synthetic biology as a paradigm has been, has been around for um, a, a shorter time, but we'll, we'll deliver the technologies that allow us to engineer biology quickly and, and efficiently and, and um, precisely. Of course, there are market drivers for this as well. There are uh, any number of forwards market projections, uh, possibly dubious, but <laughs> uh, useful at least for, fun for seeking funding organisations. And there are lots of different um, areas in which synthetic biology can impact, as I've already mentioned. Food and beverage and ag agriculture are relatively low hanging fruit and that they're not all that active at the moment, but will experience most likely massive market growth in, in the next um, handful of years. Um, this, uh, this vertical is fairly important here. This is a projected um, symbio markets. And you can, you can see the size of increase that are projected for particular areas. I'll bring the materials side, consumer goods, which is probably mostly bio-based materials side to your attention as well, because there's quite a lot of growth expected in that space. And these are very much the low hanging fruit areas. They're not human consumption, uh, food and beverage and agriculture, of course, are. That's why they're small now, but the, the regulatory environment is predicted to change and, and acceptability is predicted to change in that space as well. So what is synthetic biology? I really don't need to explain this to you, but I'll, I'll zip through a couple of um, sort of philosophical paradigms that I think sit, sit across this. And that is that, that synthetic biology, what makes it different from classical genetic engineering is that the, the, the philosophical paradigm that sits above it and the approach that's been used to do it. So it's basically application of engineering principles to biology. It uses these ideas of standardization, of abstraction, of hierarchy. So we start with the DNA code. Um, from that code, we encode parts that can be assembled to make devices, circuits, systems, and ultimately multicellular organisms. Uh, it uses these design, build, test, learn cycles to iteratively, iteratively improve on designs so that they get better and better at delivering what they need to deliver. And it's fundamentally an applied science, so it's trying to solve problems. Um, it uses massive data sets as part of that process. So we're starting to integrate much more with um, uh, artificial intelligence, particularly through machine learning algorithms to assist in that learn and design stage of the process. And because it uses standardization, it can then, uh, just like the construction process, um, use automation and it can use robotic automation. Um, the advantages that it delivers are precision, predictability for sophistication and speed for the engineering of biology. Now, of course, we also consider the scale up a market and there's often iterative design build test learn cycles that, that operate in that scale up phase. Now, one of the other principles that it relies on is the idea that there are other solutions that have not been examined or investigated or explored um, in biology. And this was, this I have to say was a bit of a revelation for me, an embarrassing revelation, having been a biologist all of my um, research career, uh, is, is, was actually the understanding of how evolution works. So evolution does not, um, you don't evolve for optimality, right? You just evolve to be better adapted than the guy next door to you who's trying to compete, compete for your niche. Um, and that means that, that it, it works fine. That's how evolution works. Um, but there is, in fact, a much greater solution space to explore. So if you, if you do have standardised componentry and you can automate your assembly techniques, then you can explore massive 
massive numbers of possibilities on a time scale of months rather than years or millennia. And you can also use um, algorithms, various different types of algorithms to reduce that solution space so it becomes a possible space that you can effectively explore, moving towards local optima solutions and ultimately global optima solutions. So it, just a little example of um, the, the differences in, in biology, different solutions that biology has evolved for different problems as gas exchange. So we use lungs, um, bird use, birds use lungs as well, they're, they're different exchange systems. Grasshoppers use a different system again, and it's much more efficient than our system. But they're probably better ways. Um, an example of this that um, I published with uh, Ellie Wurzel and Andrew Hansen. And Andrew, I saw you on the line. Hi, nice to see you. Um, more recently uh, is evolution's limited exploration uh, in plants in the space of carbon fixation. So plants have only evolved a couple of different ways to fix carbon effectively. Microbes have evolved about six or seven different ways highlighted in red here, but there are a whole lot of different theoretical pathways that could be used, some of them more efficient to fix carbon. And if you wanna know more about that, then um, go have a chat with uh, Toby Erb at the Max Planck Institute. They're really doing uh, groundbreaking stuff in this space and it's very exciting. Right, so we've got this future science platform and we need to solve all the problems of the world in it. Uh, how do we do that when we don't have a fully established capability in the country? Um, so we had a set of KPIs that we operate to in the future science platform and they sit firstly around building that community and building that science capability. So building the, the future leaders in the space. Also uh, building the infrastructure we've talked about in the biofoundry space. Um, and building an informed social science discourse and policy development that will support pathways to impact. And also using that social science, not just to talk to the public and influence policy, but to, to influence how the science is developed. So we get um, more acceptable science being developed and, and real pathways to impact being developed through these approaches. So breaking down cultural barriers between disciplines was a really important part of this. Um, and developing the capability to uh, to uh, translate that into the real world, which requires more than just science. It requires also um, a, a lot more other humanities and, and social sciences to get that uh, to impact. So the first two capabilities, the KPIs I talk about together, building the community and building the, the human resources. So we really want to drive that step change in capability. As I said, break down those cultural barriers and, and train the next generation. Um, we did that effectively. So now we have um, over 41 partners uh, nationally and internationally. So 24 Australian, 17 international. I think our Canadian partner is located in Mont Montreal, no, Quebec. I think, oh, no, I'll have to check that. We do have somebody in Canada <laughs> we work with. Uh, we've got about 250 people involved in these programs, 84 projects, and we've trained 90 early, mid early and mid-career researchers from the PhD stage through to the uh, C level, which is um, uh, assistant, assistant professor level, I guess. And most of them around the PhD and uh, early postdoc levels. We have run uh, four future science platform workshops, uh, com sponsored seven conferences and run a variety of training programs, including, which I uh, forgot to include a slide about, but I will mention now, we have established an Australian um, iGEM competition. So we found it was really difficult to engage with iGEM because we're in the Southern Hemisphere um, and it, it doesn't align with our teaching semesters or, or trimesters. So it was really difficult and really expensive to engage with IGEM, especially when it's held uh, physically because it's a long way to go. And um, it, it's just very expensive to get people there from here. So we have run a pilot, pilot version of an Australian IGEM um, competition this year. It was hugely successful just with a, a small number of, of teams in it. And we're planning to build that and grow that going forwards. Out of the program now, I've been operating now for three and a half years. Um, and the science all started from pretty much zero. So no background um, whatsoever from a standing start. So we've delivered 115 publications, 170 conferences, the two patents that have come out of the program, there's six more in provisional, state, um, provisional prep status, two spin-out companies and about $5 million of revenue from science that, have come, that has come out of the Future Science Platform and has accelerated to Horizon One Science where it's actually uh, delivering into the market. Um, so now we're looking to grow, foster and grow this community. Um, 
drive a cultural change that's required to build interdisciplinary programs and take the next step, particularly in, in um, engaging more in the social science space. We have got a nicely developed social science program, but more in that space, uh, techno-economic evaluation and in, um, in the machine learning space that we need to um, start dealing with these very, very large data sets and start uh, understanding how machine learning algorithms can suggest the next iteration of experiments. We operate fairly broadly. We're a very um, um, uh, broad church. Um, there are two, there are six areas that we work in called application domains. So two of them are uh, enabling capabilities. So one is foundation, cap foundation technology. So that's where we build all our componentry, um, circuitry, uh, our uh, artificial intelligence and our data are all stored in this application domain and also our biofoundry. Maximising impact is a social science application domain, and that looks at the social, legal, ethical, institutional and regulatory issues that surround getting impact out of synthetic biology. We have four areas into which the science is delivered. Industrial biotechnology is our classical um, uh, metabolic engineering and bio-based chemicals and materials application domain. Environment and biocontrol works uh, across the um, biocontrol of invasive pests and, and organisms, um, environmental remediation and environmental resilience. So engineering resilience to climate change, for example. An example of that is engineering corals to cope with um, increased water temperatures. Uh, health and medicine is a fairly obvious one. There's low hanging fruit and good pathways to market um, for health and medical technologies. And agriculture and food is another space that we're working in, um, primarily around precision fermentation and um, synthetic biology based food ingredients and additives. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about establishment of a biofoundry, of a biofoundry in Australia, so our KPI3. So most of you probably know what a biofoundry is, but in case some of you don't, it's basically a collection of robots that does automated high throughput um, uh, engineering of DNA componentry and biological uh, systems. So in particular, it, it replaces um, us at the bench who do cloning, which is a really good thing to replace because it's mostly mindless by the time you get to the bench stage. Um, it's semi or fully automated. So an example of a fully automated system would be the Ginkgo uh, Bioworks um, facility in Boston. Uh, Semi-automated or and moving towards high levels of automation is the London Biofoundry at Imperial. Uh, our Biofoundry is a, is a partially automated Biofoundry. It's based in the building I'm sitting in now at Ecosciences Precinct in Brisbane in Australia. It was initially established as a joint facility between the university across the, the river here, University of Queensland, but we found it was pretty much impossible to run a facility across two different organisations um, and we weren't able to access sufficient space over at UQ, so we've shifted it over to CSIRO now. <clears throat> The foundry basically uh, takes your DNA encoded designs, and I apologise for the, like the commercial, um, the commerciality of these slides here. They're, they're the biofoundry slides, so I usually present them, um, but it basically tells you what it does. So, so it we the, we take your designs essentially um, and convert those through for high throughput. Um, we assemble those DNA parts, transform organisms, phenotype them, collect the data, analyze the data, and provide it all back to you. Um, it operates on the design, build, test, learn paradigm that we all use. And importantly, it involves the first step of sitting with the clients, consulting for project planning and for um, adapting their protocols for high throughputs using the robots that we use. And we also do a bit of automation training for scientists and take them into the, the lab and show them how to work things. So a really important thing that we're dealing with here is a change in paradigm in the way that we're doing science. So it's not like the bespoke mastercrafts and spending you know, six years doing one particular thing and tweaking this thing and that thing. And it's very much high throughput um, uh, modifications. And it means that you have to change the way you think about doing a science. So if you're applying for a grant, grant from a granting agency, you're probably not going to apply for a full-time postdoc to run that project for you. You're probably going to apply for enough for, for several students and maybe half a postdoc. Um, and then a, a bunch of funding that's then put into, um, into the biofoundry to help deliver that uh, high throughput engineering capability. Um, it has a modular workflow uh, with a laboratory integration management system that sits above it. So the, the system we use is by a company called Tesselogen. Uh, and there are a number of liquid handling robots. And let's see if, whoops, uh, this works. 
This should work if I click on it. Oh, apparently not, it doesn't. Um, so there are a number of robots that, that work, one of which you should be able to see operating there, but um, this is a very temperamental movie. Um, so we have an echo liquid handler, which is really fantastic. And this is one, one of the pieces of equipment that um, all the stories about it are true. It's awesome. You should totally get one if you can. Uh, Felix liquid handler, cyclone handling robot. And we've had this pixel colony picking robot, which is really an, an awesome piece of kit as well. And we use these for DNA assembly, transformation and colony picking and phenotype selection. And the picker is, is really neat. It lets you pick phenotype based on a number of different um, uh, parameters. Uh, fluorescence is one of the most common ones that we use. And we have a whole lot of fluorescent mechanisms attached to different types of engineering strategies that we can convert. Um, then we look at the design that, so that it's, oh, I put this in the wrong order. <laughs> yes, I did put them in the wrong order. Um, and then the, the so the, the, the DNA assembly is followed by colony screening, um, phenotyping, DNA recovery, plasma uh, uh, sequencing, strain uh, plasma genome sequencing, strain analysis, um, and then feeding all those data sets into our machine learning algorithms. So we've got a ZAG analyzer, we've got a, a, a citation five plate reader, and a Cytoflex flow cytometer, and we're getting facts um, uh, with a sorter shortly. The advantages of this approach are that you, 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 it's possible to do different types of experiments. So you can simultaneously explore massive numbers um, and explore unique hypotheses using these kinds of approaches. You can miniaturize your reactions so it becomes very, very small. Um, of course, that means that uh, it does, doesn't mean it's necessarily a lot cheaper because you've got, you're doing a lot more experimentation. And ultimately, it reduces the time to get to whatever strain it is that you're looking for, whatever design you're looking for. Um, so yeah, so it's basically a bioengineering service facility. Uh, there are three core staff that work in it now and three senior scientists who provide the, the science and operational environment for it to effectively operate. Um, there are different types of assembly techniques that we use. There are a range of um, hosts that we're currently working in and we're expanding that range. Uh, there are a bunch of QC capabilities we have and of course there's a machine learning side of things as well. There is a global biofoundries alliance of academic biofoundries around the world, and we work together on developing hardware, software, business models, policies, etc., and communicating the value. And you guys have one right there in, in Canada, so at, the, at Concordia, the genome foundry at Concordia. So get in touch with Vincent Martin there if you want to know more about the local capability. Right, the next uh, KPI is translation. Um, so we're interested here, as I've already mentioned, in delivering sustainable solutions that deliver to triple bottom line impact. So economic environment and societal. So not just, just translation and commercialization, um, but, but delivering really along that impact pathway. We use a framework called an impact pathway framework that involves looking at what inputs we have and what impacts that we want to achieve at the end of the program. And then we fill in the middle um, through the activities, outputs and outcomes space. And this is a really useful uh, um, framework to be able to operate in. And we develop our KPIs through that framework. You can access that as a service that CSIRO provides for a given project or program. Uh, we're seeing, as I mentioned already, predictable IP emerging. There's a lot of industry that's engaging proactively with us and, and a bit of revenue that's coming out of it as well. We do have a problem in Australia where the translation environment is, is kind of stymied. Um, so we don't have the sil Silicon Valley by, by startup culture that's been really effective in other countries. Um, and I'm not sure what the situation is in Canada. I think you do it possibly a little bit better than us in this space. I'd be interested to hear though in the discussion session. But we do have this really deep valley of death for advanced biotechnologies. There's a there's a high cost of spin out and a high cost of science generally and a long delivery time, which requires really patient venture capital. And we historically haven't had access to all that much venture capital, though we're seeing a lot more coming into Australia now, particularly um, Asian venture that's, uh, that's uh, expanding its interest areas into Australia. The risk profiles have to be have to be acceptable both for the venture capital and for the scientists, and we, we do run into personal equity and conflict of interest um, issues. And one of the things we don't have in Australia is a bio incubator or a bio accelerator, and these have been really transformational in other countries, particularly the US and and uh, Europe. They provide a physical and a virtual environment that that builds that sort of entrepreneurial and translational ecosystem. So it includes not just scientists, but um, training for, for um, training and mentoring, so techno-economic evaluation, pathways to impact, um, social science capabilities, venture capital, et cetera. 
Um, we're looking to establish one of these now. Um, we're looking to bring in some major international companies to help build that capability. And we have the advantage here that we have all this feedstock. So we have a we great feedstock capability. We have IP secure environment. We have access to um, the Asian nations that are major markets for outcomes of these uh, and products of this um, these technologies and a variety of other things, including um, R&D tax incentives that make it attractive for um, uh, specific companies to come here. Uh, we will have to establish a new legal entity and instruments, and that always takes time. But importantly, it can deliver to a lot of advanced biotechnologies, this type of type of um, what we call physical containment level two uh, research space that will make it um, possible to do this kind of uh, um, spin out or, or, or economic development on a much broader scale. We're working very closely with the Queensland government to establish the first bioincubator in Australia, and I'd you know, love to see that rolling out across other major capital cities as well. And getting this off the ground will be really transformational to the Australian bioeconomy. Last couple of KPIs uh, are informed social discourse, policy development and technology development. So the social, legal, ethical, regulatory and institutional issues around that space. We started um, trying to understand uh, what Australians thought of synthetic biology and it turns out uh, not very much because they didn't have very much brand awareness. Um, but the outcomes of that indicate that there's a lot of interest in this type, these types of technologies and a surprisingly high acceptability um, when they consider what the technologies can deliver in the current environment. Um, it also looks at legal aspects. So we have a couple of people working on ownership, intellectual property, benefit sharing and equity. Um, and we have a lot of ongoing contributions to the broader conversation uh, in Australia around advanced biotechnology through um, press releases, articles in, in the conversation, various other um, bits and pieces there. And in particular to national policy development that I've already talked about and a lot to international policy development through the um, through organisations like the Conventional and Bio Convention of Biological Diversity, World Economic Forum, etc. The second part of this is using the social science to inform synthetic biology technology development. And this has been a really fun part of the program to be involved in because it requires champions such as myself to sit across social sciences and um, biotechnological sciences, uh, champion that the value of that engagement and help to build cultural change so in both the social science and the biophysical science community so that they can work more effectively together and, and deliver those pathways to impact. Right, deep breaths. Now I'm going to switch focus. Um, I'm presuming that we'll leave the, the question sessions to the end. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes to talk now about the actual um, research science that I do. <clears throat> so I um, am interested in an, in an area of natural products called, um, a group of natural products called isoprenoids. And they're really interesting as model systems because I've got a lot of interesting biochemistry and a lot of natural applications that they use for um, in nature and an enormous amount of chem chemical diversity that uh, delivers them the capability to have lots of different applications in nature. And because of that chemical diversity, they also have very many different industrial applications. So everywhere from um, high value, relatively low volume products such as pharmaceuticals to uh, low value, high volume products such as fuels and fuel additives. And that value volume uh, relationship is actually really important as synthetic biologists to understand. The first thing you should do when you, you embark upon a project is to understand the techno-economic environment in which you're operating because a lot of products aren't actually economically viable and, and, viable, and you won't ever be able to deliver impact in them. Fuels are really, really challenging. There have been massive amounts of, of funding thrown at trying to get uh, effective bio-based fuels. Um, we're still not there yet. It's really challenging to redesign biological systems to redirect massive amounts of carbon flux to um, desired products in that space. But we can access mid-value products, industrial chemicals, um, agriculture and horticulture products, food and food additives, of course, and uh, various other things in the spaces that are more accessible. And of course, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical side, medical side is, is a lot easier. Um, so these eyes of prenides, of course, um, are really fantastic molecules, but it's often not economically viable to deliver an industrial process from their natural sources. They usually come from plants for a variety of reasons, primarily a, a lack of sufficient abundance um, to deliver uh, enough to the market. So of course we're doing metabolic engineering of microbes and a variety of different microbes to address this problem. Uh, isoprenoids have uh, 
unusually in biology, two unique biochemically unique pathways for their biosynthesis. So the mevalonate pathway that's found in us and in yeast, where we do quite a lot of work, uh, starts from central carbon metabolism at acetyl-CoA and delivers five carbon phosphate intermediates, isopentyl pyrophosphate and dimethyl allyl pyrophosphate. Um, prokaryotes have a, a different pathway. It starts at adrenal, adrenal pyrophosphate, uh, sorry, um, glycerhydride 3 phosphate and pyruvate from central carbon metabolism. Completely different metabolic pathway that delivers exactly the same five carbon phosphates at the end of it. Downstream from those is a, is a part of metabolism called phosphate metabolism, where you have condensation reactions happening between these five carbon phosphates to deliver 10 carbon intermediate called geranyl pyrophosphate, 15 carbon um, upon another condensation phanosyl pyrophosphate, then a 20 carbon, so on and so forth. Those form the precursors for a variety of different classes of isoprenoids with very curious names that I won't go into now, uh, and ultimately about 70,000 different isoprenoid compounds with a massive amount of chemical diversity. So they're modified and decorated with a whole, whole range of biochemical uh, um, uh, reactions that happen, the full range in, in, in biology. We first got into production of these compounds through a collaboration with, um, with Amaris, funded by the Queensland Government and various other stakeholders, to look at making the, the 10 carbon component of aviation fuel. So it transpires that if you blend um, the green apple smell, which is farnesine, with 10 carbon components, limonene, which is the lemony smell of, um, of citrus fruits, and chymine, which is a thyme smell, uh, then you can get a, a product which um, has the same burn pro properties as, as Jet A1. And it effectively works. Uh, so in, in 2014, first demonstration flight on a farnesine uh, limonene chymine blend was made. The, the limonene and the chymine in this case came from um, uh, petrochemical sources. And the reason was is because it's very challenging to make those 10 carbon intermediates. So we were addressing this particular problem, is, which is the production of these 10 carbon intermediates. And one of the problems that we face is that we can introduce a limonene synthase into microorganisms, but we get very, very little limonene. And the reason is because the phanosyl pyrophosphate synthase enzyme in in yeast and, and uh, E. coli and other microorganisms is a bifunctional enzyme. So it does two condensation reactions. It doesn't release the, the 10 carbon adrenal pyrophosphate precursor from the active site before it immediately adds another um, another uh, IPP to make phanosyl pyrophosphate. So that's a bit of a problem because there's not much of a free pool of adrenal pyrophosphate in the cell to make limonene from. So of course you go to plants and you look around and, and get some dedicated geranyl pyrophosphate synthases, which are very common in the chloroplasts of plants. And you put those in and you find it doesn't work very well. And you go back to the original phanosyl pyrophosphate so synthase and you do some engineering around the active site that excludes the C15 phanosyl moiety. And you engineer um, a, a, phanosyl, a, 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 a geranyl pyrophosphate, which competes effectively with phanosyl pyrophosphate synthase and results in, a, in an appropriate metabolic balance that still delivers sufficient phanosyl pyrophosphate to produce sterols and, and namely ergosterol in yeast. So you know, the yeast use this pathway mainly for production of ergosterol, which is an integral membrane component. Uh, so we developed, by the way, a bunch of useful vectors. So if you're working in yeast, keep an eye out for these. They're available for ad gene, from AdGene. Uh, they have antibiotic selection markers in them. Um, they're good for prototrophs for that reason. Uh, several different promoters and terminators that, that you can use. You can use them for ectopic expression or integration, and you can use um, recombinase mediated marker removal and recycling with them. So we messed around with a whole lot of different um, geranyl pyrophosphate synthases and, and limonene synthases and optimized transcription and trace, translation elements. By the way, all this is done by hand. We didn't have a biofoundry yet. And we got a 250 fold increase in limonene, which is really awesome. But if you start from zero, then you still have pretty close to zero even with a 250 fold increase. So we had a look at the intermediates um, from central carbon uh, metabolism all the way through the mevalonate pathway in yeast. And we found that yes, hooray, we are getting lots of um, geranyl pyrophosphate being produced, but it's not being um, efficiently channeled through into limonene. So our problem here is that the limonene synthase, which is really common in isoprenoid pathway engineering, the limonene synthases are not very effective enzymes and they're not very amenable to engineering for improved catalytic properties. Um, the, the solution is to put more copies uh, in and, and solve that problem and we can actually do that. So um, one of the problems that we deal with commonly in yeast, particularly in this pathway, is that it's an essential metabolic pathway and you can't knock out genes to redirect carbon into the pathway of interest. 
Um, and also we find that in some cases, it's hard to transcriptionally downregulate or knock down because it doesn't work very effectively. One of the reasons being that the protein is extremely stable. And so Bing Yim Pen, who was at the time doing a PhD, uh, PhD in my group, now a postdoc, decided to look at protein degradation as a metabolic engineering strategy in yeast. And he targeted ERG9, the squalene synthase that converts funicyl pyrophosphate through the squalene for this particular approach. It can be transcriptionally downregulated, but it's just a proof of principle at this stage to see if he can get similar results using um, protein-based degradation. So he's interested in neurolidol, which has lots of different industrial applications. He introduced a neurolidol synthase and he didn't get very much neurolidol coming out. So this is neurolidol, squalene and ergosterol in the yeast. So he took, took a look at this ERG9 um, uh, enzyme and he noticed that there was an ergosterol, a, a endoplasmic reticulum targeting sequence on it. Um, and he... Uh, tagged it with um, a green fluorescent protein that confirmed that it was endoplasmic uh, reticulum associated. Um, and so he identified what's called a PEST sequence or an endoplasmic reticulum associated protein degradation sequence and tagged that on there as well. Um, he, when he grew them together, he noted that they grow, both grew with the same um, uh, growth characteristics indicating that it wasn't causing Tech, uh, tech toxicity, so tagging of the ergo wasn't causing toxicity, um, but the fluorescence was significantly decreased in the uh, pest tag strain. So that's a proxy for erg9 um, presence. And when he engineered that back into um, uh, the yeast strain, he doubled the neurolidol. Sorry, I forgot part of my story here, actually. Um, before uh, doing the um, degradation experiment here, he massively upregulated in the upstream mevalonate pathway to deliver more precursors into the system. And that's how he got this um, quite large increase in neurolidol production. But a lot of it went through to squalene. So we saw this increase in squalene. So by degrading the erg9 protein, he was then able to increase the neurolidol production, drop the squalene levels back down to where they ought to be and even um, access some of the agosterol pool, which didn't seem to affect growth at all um, and isn't actually statistically significant, but I suspect that it's getting quite a lot of uh, carbon being channeled into our neurolidol product here. Okay, um, now in order to do synthetic biology at scale, you need a whole lot of different components and um, Bingen and Tom, who's also then uh, doing a PhD in my group, realised that we actually had a relatively narrow toolbox of componentry for yeast, despite it being such a workhorse. And they spend a lot of time, particularly being in, um, examining and understanding promoters and their behaviours at different stages in the bioprocess. So all the way from the exponential phase, which is when most promoter analysis is done, across the dioxic shift and into the um, ethanol phase. Because it's important to understand when you're uh, engineering for a bioprocess, how your promoter behaves um, throughout the fermentation, not just in the exponential phase. Now, it's on my intention to go through all this um, data here. It's really just to say there's this huge amount of, of characterization of promoter sequences uh, done uh, on different carbon sources and different stages in the bioprocess. And there are a number of publications that we've put out that describe that work. So go out and have a look for that, I including um, expanding the GAL promoter kit, which has been very useful for us. And um, we've got some stronger GAL promoters, even than the, the GAL promoters are available now. So if you um, take your toolbox of kits and, and combinatorially examine those with a variety of different genes in the mevalonate pathway and, and down regulation and up regulation and protein um, degradation, et cetera, and apply that to a neurolidol production, um, then you can get quite high net levels of neurolidol. So in batch, Bingen got about 400 milligrams per litre and then in a fed batch fermentation, he's up to about six grams per litre of neurolidol, which is really exciting. So to get this six, to get grams per litre in a, uh, an academic laboratory, I was very pleased with that. So that, that can deliver mid-range um, mid chemicals. Now, um, we then targeted uh, turned our attention to the C10 node. So targeting this essential enzyme, farnesyl pyrophosphate, and determining can we use protein degradation as a useful approach for downregulating that. Um, Bingen used a, a, a degron for this. So the, the farnesyl pyrophosphate is a cytosolic enzyme and it can be tagged with a cytosolic uh, degradation signal. And he used three different ones here. And it turns out that they were really extremely savage in their degradation capabilities. So this is a green fluorescence protein. You can see there's a massive drop in fluorescence um, 
once they're tagged with these three different degrons and you get a half-life that goes from about 20 hours to about 30, 60 minutes, something like that. So that's great, except we did the transformation and used to tag the FPPS with these three different degrons. He got absolutely nothing back. And we surmised from that that it was uh, fatal because it uh, degraded the FPPS, which is great. Tells you that it works, but it works too well. How to deal with this problem? Well, you use a circuit feedback system and you exploit the um, the, the same mechanism that yeast uses to upregulate the, the sterile pathway when there's insufficient agosterol. So there are a number of genes in the sterile path pathway that have um, sterile responsive elements and being in constructed promoters that had sterile responsive elements um, that he could put in front of the N-degron, the degron tag in front of the ERG20 gene here. Um, and he used a number of different combinations of sterile responsive elements and, and um, uh, degron tags. And he was ultimately able to get some strains back from that. And he was able to double the limonene production in those strains. This is without increasing the, uh, the number of copies of limonene synthase, which is quite a nice demonstration that we can um, increase flux through to limonene. And now on top of this, you increase the copy number. Um, and we have developed a really cool mechanism to do that that I can't talk about in detail because it's subject to uh, patent investigation, but we can currently get grams per liter of monoterpene titers um, as well using uh, these, these bioprocesses, which is really exciting. Now, because I spent so much time talking about how to establish a synthetic biology um, community and industry in Australia, I'm coming up to time now. I, I do have a little bit um, of other work that I can talk to you about, but perhaps we'll come back to that if we have a time at the end of the discussion section. Um, and so this is in the area of stragalactones, which is uh, an interesting new terpenoid molecule. But I might just take a pause now and, and call out for questions. And if we have five minutes at the end, then I'll come back to this and, and talk a little bit about um, really cool stuff that's coming out of the, the program uh, in the future. So I'll just take, zip through this stuff now and take you to the last slide. Um, so there's the biosensor stuff in here that I think you might be particularly interested in, but obviously there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and I want to thank the people who actually do the work in the group. Um, so up until recently, I was at the University of Queensland at the Australian Institute for Bioengineering and Nanotech Technology and seconded for half of my time into CSIRO. As of the middle of this year, I've taken the jump and, and I'm full-time in CSIRO now. But the people who actually do the work, really fantastic group of scientists, um, currently still over at ARBN, um, but we're establishing a group here and at Queensland University of Technology. So I also have adjunct professorships at Queensland University of Technology and Griffith University. So I'll stop there and invite questions. We've got, a, I think we've got about 10 minutes or so left um, and we can have a bit of a discussion. If we have time, we can get back and do some more science at the end. Thanks. Wow, thank you so much, Claudia. I wish I can talk like you at 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in Australia, you get really used to it. <laughs> well, all of the, it was very exciting to hear about both the science and building the actual synthetic biology community in Australia. Uh, I think like, I would like to know what was the, the most challenging um, part at the beginning of the, uh, of the Symbio uh, building. Mm. Well, not what I thought was gonna be the challenging part to be frank. Right. So the challenging part was that I thought I was painting a big target on my head and would be um, subject to a lot of attack from the community and um, interest groups who are really worried about the demo side of things. But honestly, in the, the sort of 15, 10, 15 years I've been working in this space, that's only happened once and at a pretty low level and a pretty manageable level probably because I was so prepared to have to cope with that. I was you know, waiting for it to happen. So I was really ready when it came along. Um, so it, it wasn't that space. Um, I, in, it was in this really more in the space of um, competitive engagement from, from organizations that wanted to have a footprint in synthetic biology and more importantly, wanted to lead in, in that, that space in Australia, which ultimately was really great, you know, um, but had to be managed in, in sort of a complex way because of course the funding environment is brutal in any, any country and it's particularly brutal in, in Australia, recognized in you know, nature and science publications as being brutal in Australia. 
And so there's a lot online if you're trying to establish yourself in a new field and, and, and if you want to represent as, as, as leading in the space. Um, but we have, I think we, we, you know, we got through that. We have a really established, vibrant community. I didn't actually mention that we've just been awarded, um, well, about 12 months ago, an Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in Synthetic Biology, which is run out of Macquarie University and focuses on the more sort of basic science, I guess, in the space. And it's a real, um, you know, it's, it's a $60 million program as well, $68 million program program or actually might be 40 million dollars anyway, a big program and there are six different nodes at six different universities and CSIRO is a partner on that as well so the community has really um, come together and matured the science coming out of it is wonderful um, synthetic biology Australasia is still going strong so yeah the, the challenging part was dealing with people to be frank but not the people that I thought it would be congrats on that uh, we will take there's Ben who raised his hand do you want to ask your question directly or to write it down uh, if, if you can hear me, I can ask it. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so you said uh, uh, someone from CSIRO approached you and then invited you eventually to to see the PM, which is which is a fantastic story. Um, I'd love for something like that to happen in Canada. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on what led to that and um, some suggestions for how we could make that happen here. <clears throat> Um, I wish I knew a bit more about that. I should go and ask um, because the person who approached me is now my line manager here at CSIRO. Um, so I, it really came from a concerted amount of, of lobbying that had been going on for several years prior to. So I had been uh, asked to go down to Canberra and talk to federal MPs um, prior to that when synthetic biology was really sort of just sort of becoming a thing. So this would have been, I guess, in the very early 2000s. And there was a recognition that this sort of technology was coming online. America was a long way ahead. It had the potential to really revolutionize manufacturing, biomet-based manufacturing in Australia, but nobody really knew very much about it. And so there was a combination of um, you know, upwards lobbying, I guess, from myself and a number of other people, including CSIRO. And CSIRO, being a government organisation, has much more direct access to the government than um, other research organisations might happen, might happen to have. Um, and them reaching out and saying, hey, tell us about this. So the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator wanted to know more about it because it's right in their space. Um, so th things like that. Um, so I guess the key piece of advice there is seeking champions who have reach and access in industry and in government and have the capability to say, hey, there's this thing on the horizon that's really important, you need to be involved, you need to know more about it. And it snowballed from there. And then the Chief Scientists of Australia got on board. Um, that, that's uh, Zalan Finkel at the time, uh, still is about to step down. Um, and he's an electrical engineer and he just got synthetic biology. So when, when I spoke to him about it and I used the, the classical circuit analogy, he was like, yeah, yeah, this totally makes sense. And, you know, forget that we had this problem called evolution and, and mutation that kind of gets in the way when we're doing synthetic biology. And it's not really actually like engineering a circuit board at all when it comes down to it. Um, but he was, he was a real proponent. So he was the one who... Um, who actually ultimately invited me down to talk to the PM, who uh, put it in front of the, the, the Prime Minister Science Council and, and sought um, that sort of high level federal and executive support for it. We have a question from Andrew. Uh, hi, Claudia, that was a great overview. Um, my question is, when you're trying to connect with machine learning AI uh, community, how much education do you have to do on each side to get them speaking the same language? All of it, <laughs> a lot, <laughs> and it's really critical. The first thing you have to do is demonstrate the value proposition because they're off doing their own thing and they don't even speak biology at all, uh, much of the time. Um, what you need to do is train Nexus people who have an interest in biology and interest in machine learning. So we've got a few people. Um, so Macha Halovko is, is the guy in my program who, who champions it for us. And he's interested in uh, big data and algorithms in machine learning. 
interested enough to go off and sit and talk with machine learning um, experts, learn how to, to do it, learn enough of it about, about it himself so he understands it. So I, I know enough of about it to know that it's really valuable and I can champion it from a high level. Um, he knows enough of about it to do it a little bit himself and translate the science into um, their science so that the language is there so that we know what biological data sets they need to be useful in their algorithms and they know what outputs from the algorithms are going to be useful for us. So it really requires um, champions and a significant amount of education that takes time. It's cultural change that always takes time. Sorry, I'm just waving my arms to get the automatic lights to come back on. All right, here we go. <laughs> But by the way, in response to Ben's comment before, being in federal parliament in the cabinet room was really weird. It's 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 like made out like it's decorated like a 60s, like yes minister sort of 60s style um, place and it's it's technology secure so you can't even take a smartphone or a smartwatch in there and if they do, Australian Federal Police have to seal the room and sweep it and uh, it costs $25,000 so it's a very weird experience. <clears throat> Claudia, how do you think we can change people or at least help evolve people's perception about synthetic biology? Because not, not everyone of the taxpayers will be happy to know that their money is going to fund GMOs and genetic engineered um, plants, animals, yeast, etc. Well, for a start, um, for a start, you, you need to change your language and consider it a process of earning trust rather than changing perception. So perception change happens when you have when you have trust. And there's a lot of trust that needs to be earned, right? Because there's a lot of history there. But there is also a massive change. There's a new generation of people and there's a, there's a new generation of very tech savvy people. So we're not we're not talking to the you know 60s, 70s, 80s people. We're talking to the 2000s and noughties, the next generation of people who um, should they work in a you know, company in Sweden and the CEO says, hey, do you want a little grain of rice sized implant in the webbing between your thumb and forefinger and then you can wave your hand and the door will open, you can get your photocopies of the machine, go, yeah, that sounds cool to me. Like, I'm not up for that personally, right? But 60% or 70% of this company of general millennials said, yeah, sure, go for it. Let's do it. Sounds like fun, right? So there's a really... There's a generational change in the way that people engage with science and technology. Like, you know, we've all got our, our phones. They're like, you know, part of our bodies are an extension of our personality now. Um, so the way that people are engaging with technology is really different. And biology is just another technology, right? So if you, you won't, you, you, you can't have that building of trust and that um, change unless you engage with it. So getting out, talking to people, training your scientists to talk to people and out of their ivory towers and be able to communicate their science and recognizing and championing the importance of that. Um, the importance of the, the responsibility of doing that as a technologist working in the space. It is critical. If you're just doing science in your ivory tower and you're doing synthetic biology with, that, with a disregard for the impact that that will have, uh, then you're not being responsible at all about how you're doing the science. So that's critical. Um, I'm very conscious of the time um, and being close to time now. I'm just um, ask me the next question, but I'll just check if I'm late and what I'm late for <laughs> the next meeting. We have another question from Ben. So, uh, if you if you have to run, I understand it's actually more of a, a comment and a, a compliment. Um, but I, oh, I, thank I, you. No, I don't <laughs> have to run. It just says remember something here, which means that, um, <laughs> I think that's everyone's stuff. phones these days as we've moved online. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm good. For, I'm good for another sort of 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> oh, 